Welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids. I'm Tony Kolank. I'm a professor at Ave Maria School of Law. I'm also the father of five and a homeschooling columnist and the author of the medieval teen fiction series, The Harwood Mysteries. By the way, book five in that series is due to release this October. Book four has been very blessed with several book awards. So please check out the series for your teens if you're interested at antonycolank.com. Today, we're speaking with DJ Dixon, an author, a father, and an educator, and we're going to be speaking about how we can try to stem the tide of teens losing their faith and leaving the church. My guest today is DJ Dixon. He's an educator, a father, a husband, and he was also the product of 12 years of Catholic education before enrolling in a public university. And it was through those experiences that we're going to be talking about today that he became dismayed that perhaps his and subsequent generations are lapsing in their faith, which led him to author his first work of fiction, Saint Jerk, which we'll be talking about today. He lives in Wisconsin with his wife and children. DJ, welcome to The Shepherd's Pie. Hello, Tony, and hello, listeners. It's a real privilege to talk with you here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I love St. Jerk. You sent me a copy. I've been able to start getting through it, and I love the concept. But before we dive into uh, that story a little bit, uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your background, and, and again, what kind of got you into writing for youth? Yeah, sure. A real quick background on me. I am a cradle Catholic, born, raised, still living in the upper Midwest. Squarely in Generation X, I've been married 25 years and the dad of girls in high school and in college. Growing up, as you said, I attended Catholic school from first grade through high school. Uh, Moved out to attend public university, had a career that spanned fields from state politics to higher education. We are, I think, a pretty ordinary Catholic family in that, you know, mass is a priority every weekend. You know, we're actively involved in our church. Uh, We've got a great school, fortunately, attached to our parish. And in fact, my wife is a teaching assistant there. Our girls attended that Catholic school from uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. But when it came to high school for them, we really didn't have a better option for them as a family than the public school. About 10 years ago, when my older daughter was in her last years of Catholic school, right, seventh grade, eighth grade, the dad and me started to worry a bit, thinking ahead to how her experience of going to a a massive public high school might affect her faith. As her world got bigger, is she be meeting more people from different backgrounds? That's not necessarily an unhealthy thing, right? But at a school that wasn't grounded in Catholicism like she was accustomed to. You know, I thought back to my own high school and college years and, and how I wish I knew some things then that I know now that would have helped me. So I started tinkering with this idea of writing down some life lessons for her and, um, I'll leave it at that because it partially sets the stage for what motivated me to write St. Jerk. Yeah, great. Yeah. And you are, as a parent, you know, are experiencing some of the same things. I know a lot of us as parents uh, have experienced and have some of the same concerns. That's one of the reasons why I have this podcast to begin with, you know, why I started writing for youth also. So uh, again, I love the title St. Jerk. So maybe tell us a little bit about why you chose that title and maybe just lay out kind of the premise for the book, uh, which I think will be a nice tee up for us to discuss some of this concern about kids leaving the church today. St. Jerk. Well, the title itself, that'll become obvious about a third of the way into the book. uh, You'll see a direct reference to that and a couple other of more subtle references to it later. But it's sort of this idea of kind of that dichotomy of sometimes we we think we're doing the right thing and it doesn't take much, you know, can be one bad decision. And boy, there's one in particular that he makes that can make it feel like it's all crashing down and, and you're anything but a saint. But It's a modern day fictional story. It's told by an eighth grader named Jack who goes to a Catholic school. And and if that starts to sound familiar to what you've been talking about, well, that's by design. So for religion class at his school, every eighth grader uh, is assigned to do 20 hours of volunteer service on their own time by the end of that fall semester. So the book is a first person account from the start of the school year through about Christmas time. And as he's doing each of these different volunteer jobs, something interesting usually happens. Not all of them go bad. Some of them go very bad. While the service project kind of drives the plot for the most part, 
he also shares a lot of these other very relatable, pretty hilarious, and, and sometimes even poignant uh, experiences that make an impact on him and hopefully on his readers too. He's going to have some trouble with his friends. There'll be some pretty thought-provoking classroom conversations with their parish priests. He's going to have second thoughts about some knucklehead social media influencers that he follows. And like I said, he's going to make a really bad snap decision a little bit before uh, Christmas time. But he and his readers go on a journey that goes a bit like this, right? To start with, he gains even more assurance that his faith is true. And because it's true, then he reflects on the consequences of that and starts to think more about how it applies to his everyday life. He learns to recognize that the church is fundamentally important to being a Christian. And he comes to realize that he has complete control over the only thing that really matters in his life. And that's whether he follows God's way or the world's. Ultimately, that's a message of hope, right? That in all of the chaos of the world today, we already know where and how to find peace. And that's something that I want to deliver to the readers. And all of that is packed into a a pretty quick, well-paced 200-page uh, book. If I can add something about the, you know, I talk about this as a work of apologetics. And to be clear, I am not pretending that this is a one-volume proof of God and Christ, right? It's very surface-level stuff, but a lot of kids have never heard even that much. And again, I, I think one of the problems that we have with kids leaving the church these days is that we take for granted that they know this this stuff, right? So, so the goal here is that after reading St. Jerk, sometime later, they hear someone tell them that, well, there's no evidence for the resurrection. I mean, come on, seriously? And But I want them to remember, well, okay, but um, yeah, I remember that part where they talked about, you know, okay, well, how do you explain the, you know, something like the apostles responding the way they did, you know, from going into hiding at first to then risking their lives for the gospel, when they themselves are the ones that have known whether or not it would have happened or been true. And, you know, that's one of the many examples in St. Jerk. Again, it's really surface level stuff. But the idea here is to just keep these kids at this very critical age tethered to the faith until they're ready to dig even deeper. But the book includes much more than that. And here's where I think it's made an impression on my adult readers. Lessons like, don't presume that God holds you to the same standard as someone who doesn't know any better. He may be expecting a lot more out of you than that person. You know, the difference between romantic love and Christian love and, and how that affects the way kids think about dating and marriage. You know, to be careful not to judge others when we don't know the circumstances of their lives. And I think the humor is something that that all ages can enjoy. And even though the book is intentionally and unapologetically Catholic, no pun intended, right? It was important to me that it's accessible to all faiths. And I have reviewers that say, a great book for all ages and all denominations. I had a reviewer that wrote that even as a 70-year-old Protestant, this book made me reflect on my attitudes and actions. And then I had a reviewer that said, I laughed so hard I shot lemonade out of my nose. <laughs> and I, huh. I read those and I thought, perfect. This is exactly the reaction I was going for. So it tells me I hit the target and I, I just find that very encouraging. Sounds like some of this book may be uh, autobiographical in the sense that you drew from your own experiences as a kid. Maybe you could lay out for us a little bit of your own faith journey where you felt like you know you your own faith lapsed as a kid and and how that relates to kids today and what you're seeing. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I talked about taking for granted that kids know things that you know they may not have ever really heard or reflected on before. Again, right. I had 12 years of Catholic school, and in hindsight, I'm sorry to say, but it's it's fair to say that our religious education was lacking, to put it tactfully. Here's a true story. We had a high school reunion just a few years ago, and they had this little trivia contest. It was the boys against the girls, and they'd ask questions to one group back and forth. And it became kind of obvious that as a joke, the girls were getting these softball questions, and the boys were getting these really difficult ones. One of these, you know, quote unquote, impossible questions they asked the boys was name the luminous mysteries of the rosary. And I pounce on it. Right. I start answering on behalf of the guys. I'm like, okay, let's see. Um, And I answer this question and I finish and there's silence and people are staring at me amazed. I mean, honestly, like there was a hamster crawling out of my nose or something. And they're like, how did you know that? (laughs) And I I laughed and I kind of shrugged. But I'm thinking, 
how on earth am I the only one that knows that? <laughs> no, no, granted, the luminous mysteries, you know, right, they weren't a concept yet in my high school days, but you get the point. You know, we had 12 years of Catholic school and we knew nothing of this. You know, our parents took it for granted that we were being taught what they learned and we were left to learn that on our own. That is, if any of us cared enough to seek it out as an adult. Right. And mind you, this is the generation whose kids are in their teens and 20s now. And I think I'm sensing a pattern. I will say this. My nephews went to that same high school I went to, and they've got a fantastic education. My girls had a great experience, too. Kudos to today's uh, Catholic administrators and educators. Really appreciate what they're doing. But even before college, right, I don't mean to make this all about me, but I think it's a common experience, and it's one that repeats itself in kids today. But like most people, right, when you become teens, you gain intelligence, right, just naturally. You start to recognize that the story of, of Christianity, the resurrection, right, is pretty implausible on the surface, right? Maybe you learn something about evolution and, hey, maybe that explains everything. Or you ask yourself these same age-old questions, you know, why is there suffering in the world? And of course, because you're 14, you know everything already. So you think you're the only person that's ever pondered these questions. And it's a vulnerable age if you haven't learned the answers or, or even know that those answers exist. So it sounds like one of the problems you're identifying is that we in our generation, just aren't doing enough to even lay the basic foundation. Now, you also gave a hopeful tone, though, that perhaps mm -hmm. the, the Catholic schools may be doing a better job in our generation than the others. So maybe let's tackle that first one. I mean, what is your advice to a typical family or a typical youth group leader on how they can do a better job in this area? I think it starts with recognizing that kids are getting pounded by a culture that wants to tell them that everything they were taught what to believe really doesn't have any basis in fact. Kids can accept that, right? Take a child born in, into a Christian or Catholic family. They're baptized, right? They know the stories of Jesus and Easter and Christmas. They, they know their Bible stories. They say their prayers at night. They go to church every week. And we think, great, we have successfully raised a Christian child. <laughs> but as the years go by and the kids' intellect and reasoning develops, they just become naturally skeptical and independent. And as their world gets bigger, they are exposed to more of that culture. And those same questions I just mentioned start to creep in. And they don't may not care to ask their parents. They don't want to upset them. And they might just ride the clock out until they... So they move out of the house. And then we wonder why they're not going to church anymore. So, you know, I think the answer, it, it's just one piece of the solution, but it's a pretty big one, right? We need to arm these kids, especially at that vulnerable age, when they're smart enough to handle these sorts of arguments. Confidence that God exists, right? That Jesus is real, that the church matters in their lives, so that they know these things before those other influences have a chance to pull them away. So how do you do that? You know, the question you asked, it, there are a ton of great apologetics resources out there, but you know we have to keep in mind that age group, right? They're not <laughs> advanced enough to handle G.K. Chesterton, but they're they're smart enough to handle some some simple basic uh, answers to these questions. What are the questions that you decided in your Saint Jerk book were important enough to really want to expose to that age level uh, when when it came time to sort of setting out some of these factual bases? I think there are several, there are many, but to put some of them under the umbrella of, can we push back against this the idea that science and faith are in conflict and that you have to choose one or the other? I mean, that notion has become so embedded in the culture and it's just absurd on the face of it. It take, you know, I talk about these in the book as kindergarten level questions, right? They're being asked by people that ought to know better if they took five seconds to reflect on any of this stuff. So I want to just make that clear to kids, you know, science and faith are not in conflict at all. I mean, and that's um, some of what I get at in some of the arguments that are kind of embedded in the in the story. Yeah. And of course, that's been a major theme, even uh, going back to St. John Paul II. I mean, he tried to, I think, hammer that point back in the uh, 80s, and we're still struggling with it maybe more today than we did before. So besides the idea that maybe we're not laying a strong enough factual foundation, are there other things that, that you've seen or experienced that is, is really pulling our kids away from the faith and the church today? And, and is it any different than when we were kids? I don't know that it's much different. I guess I would say that I think kids today are facing stronger headwinds than than we did, right? I mean, 
they're not experiencing a different kind of dynamic. It's just it's just more difficult. From where I sit, we have a culture that maybe when I was younger was absent of Christianity. I think today it's just absolutely hostile to Christianity. And social media is just such a minefield, unlike anything that we've ever had to deal with before, right? And and if we don't know what our kids are exposed to online, you can put a filter on that keeps them out from uh, accessing some adults' sites. But that's not enough because social media, I mean, goodness, if Dante were writing the Inferno today, there'd be an eighth circle of hell, right? I mean, there's some great stuff out there, but an awful lot of trash. And, and maybe one thing to suggest parents do is without putting their kids on the defensive is just to say, um, you know, who are your favorite social media influencers? And just, you know, on your own, check out some of their content and just make sure that that's consistent with what you want your kids to be learning. I did an episode recently with a very faithful uh, Catholic teen, uh, Kate Waldyke from Catholic Mom and Daughter. Yeah, and we were, great episode. Yeah, and we were talking about all of the great social media content that's actually out there, apologetics-wise and faith-wise. And it's true, even on TikTok, when I've been trying to dabble in that lately and looking at some of the Christian content, there are some very powerful voices if you are looking for them. The real question may be, how do we get our kids to be more interested in turning on those influencers? Make it interesting for them, right? I mean, St. Jerk is intentionally created to pull kids that might not seek a nonfiction work of apologetics. We don't even get into that until a few chapters, right? I'm trying to hook them in. And my dirty little secret is that that's just a Trojan horse, this funny story to, to bombard them with some, some Catholic education that they hadn't bargained for. But yeah, it, a lot of others, uh, you know, gosh, I'm not unique in this. There are some incredible social media influencers that do a great job of speaking to kids in their language and making it entertaining at the same time. Father Mike Schmitz immediately comes to mind. I mean, that guy in one podcast, you could think he's, his audience is one, you know, senior citizen or one middle schooler, and it's delivered in this clear, wonderful way. And And I hope all kids are, are taking advantage of the things he's teaching. His Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year podcasts are just amazing. Yeah. So yeah, all right. We talk about getting kids interested. And again, both of us are basically writing fiction for this group because at least my belief has been if, if we can expose kids through a medium like fiction that they might be interested in, they're going to be more inclined. And so maybe uh, go back to your book for a minute and and you know, how do you do that in St. Jerk so that uh, a kid isn't going to feel like they're just getting preached at? And and maybe that's a lesson we can take away as adults when we're dealing with kids too. Yeah. And as you said, you're, you're an expert at this in your own works. The, a story has got to be relatable. A kid's going to see right through a, a story where the the narrator is saying, yeah, and then my friends went out for pizza and we said, hey, let's talk about God for a while, right? I mean, I think I was able to create a flow that um, that rings true, right? That's why when they are talking about things like, you know, does God exist? It's because the parish priest comes into the classroom and says, hey, let's talk about this and how it relates to the service project that they're all doing. You know, that's one way to do it. I think that is not an easy needle to thread, but hopefully I've done that successfully in this book as as so many authors like you have been able to do successfully. Okay, so we've got the laying the foundation for our kids a little bit better than we're doing, being more in tune with the influences in their lives, presenting things to them at their level. Uh, are there other things that you're seeing out there that are helpful to understanding why uh, we have kids leaving the church. Is there something very specific to Catholicism? I mean, uh, in my mind, you know, all of the attention the media has paid to like the priest abuse scandals has not been uh, probably something very helpful, although I'm not sure how much you think that impacts our kids. I think it is a huge pall over all of this. Uh, no question about it, right? I mean, the damage that that's done to the church's credibility is going to be long lasting. And frankly, I even touch on that a bit in my book, because in a very age appropriate way, right? This notion, and the book kind of pushes back against adults who think this way too, but yes, it was terrible. We're outraged. God bless the victims. But you know, this idea that because 
this occurred, well, what does that have to do with the truth of the faith? I mean, does that mean Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Does that mean we aren't redeemed? That Does that mean that the church has no standing anymore? And I, I think the answer is obviously no, right? I mean, there are school teachers that um, commit the same types of acts. And if a math teacher you know, robs a bank, does that mean two plus two isn't four anymore? I mean, it's a flippant reaction to it, but I think we need to remind ourselves that as awful as that situation is, it's not a reason for leaving the church. And quite frankly, I think for some adults, it's been an excuse to leave the church. Yeah. And for kids, and and I, I mean, I like your two plus two equals four analogy. I think that's pretty neat. But I think the deeper probably, I don't know if teens are going to articulate it this way, but I think the deeper question or doubt that it plants is, well, if these people are supposedly so changed by their faith, then how can somebody as holy as a priest do something like this? I think it more goes to undermining, like you said, the credibility, but also just the idea that does this faith really change people? And I don't, how do you think we crack that nut? That's a, it's a tough question. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a fair question, and it's a good one. And the answer is, well, isn't that the point of the church? I mean, we're all sinners, right? And and priests are human too. Is the kid reflecting on this thing? He or she is is perfect, right? I mean, we all have this need for redemption. It's it's why the founder of our church <laughs> came from God to be among us and to give us that you know us us lousy people this this shot at redemption if we're willing to take it. Yeah, what I like about that answer is it it's it's like what I do with my students. You know, you want to manage their expectations for different things in the class. If we build up an expectation when the kids are little that by being part of the church it means somehow you become perfect and you don't do anything wrong and your your whole life is perfect, then we probably are setting them up for failure. But if we sort of manage the expectation the way you just did, hey, you know, actually, this is why we have the church. And it's not like Jesus didn't tell us that we were still going to have suffering. And it's not like the apostles showed themselves to be like perfect people. Everything in the New Testament seems to show us, you know, yeah, we shouldn't expect perfection from people. That's exactly right. Nobody promised a life of happiness, but I hope people can try to grasp a life of peace. And there's an easy path toward that. And it's by, you know, behaving the way we already know uh, and have been taught to behave and letting everything else kind of fall into place around that. No, you know, we're not perfect. We're not going to be around people that are perfect. And it, it will do some good to remind us that just by being members of the church, we can't look at people outside of it and say, well, we've got this figured out. You don't. I think we've laid at least some of the key elements there and some of the challenges to us as adults to try to tackle this a little better. Uh, and I think this is a good time to segue into our entertainment segment. In our entertainment segment, I like to ask our guests if they have a movie or a book that they might recommend to families, especially that might be helpful on the topic of the day. And we've been talking about the importance of kids keeping their faith. Uh, DJ, I understand you've actually brought us a very good book along those lines. Yeah, you know, like I said, my book, St. Jerk, is intended to be the most entry level of apologetics besides just being a fun read. But, you know, for a much more comprehensive, in-depth treatment. I'm a big fan of Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn. It's nonfiction, but it covers everything from uh, you know God to the church and even uh, several of today's thornier topics, which I, I think is really important for kids and for adults today. And it presents it in very clear language that's definitely accessible to teens and, and maybe even some younger kids. And there's a lot that most adults will learn from it as well. So a great resource to keep handy. Big fan of Trent Horn and all his works. His podcasts are tremendous, perhaps only second to yours. Now I know that you're being uh, dishonest <laughs> here. You're going to have to go to confession after this. So why we're Catholic? So you think a teen audience would actually be able to respond to this? He, he addresses it in a way that you don't think would turn off a teen then? I do not know. It's it's nice bite-sized chunks, you know, good logical arguments. I'm a I'm a sucker for just 
these are the reasons why we believe what we believe. There's nothing more important for kids to understand that today when the whole world is telling them the other thing. All right. Well, Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn. Good recommendation. Moving in then to uh, just wrap things up, if folks are interested uh, to learn more about you or your writing, or especially if they want to get their hands on a copy of St. Jerk, uh, where would you like them to go? Yep. It's a self-published book. And right now it's available only on Amazon. Invite readers to go there. My uh, author page has my contact information. I'd love to hear from you and uh, hope you'll give it a look. And it's in available in both uh, paperback and ebook format? That's correct. All right, DJ, it's been great having you on the show. Really appreciate your insights on uh, this issue and kind of the fun way that you're able to address it uh, in St. Jerk. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks very much, right? I mean, we had some fun, but these are really important issues. And uh, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you and to share some things with you and your listeners. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the show today. Uh, We've been speaking with DJ Dixon about some of the challenges in our kids uh, keeping their faith and staying in the church. Again, this is Anthony Barone Kolank. If you have a question for me or a topic you want me to cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonykolank.com. And you can, of course, learn more about the Harwood Mysteries there also. Until next time, may God bless you and your families as we work together to raise faithful kids.